Mrs. Tate and I walked through the hall with purpose, then rounded the corner to the commons. This time, the panic rose so quickly, it made it to my throat before Tate could pull me into the large room. She must have sensed my fear, because she squeezed my shoulders harder and pressed on more quickly. The commons. Once the place to hang out in the mornings, ordinarily packed shoulder to shoulder, was empty, save for the clusters of empty tables and chairs. At the far end, the end where Christy Bruder had fallen, someone had installed a bulletin board. Across the top were construction paper cutout letters reading, We Will Remember. And the board was papered with notes, cards, ribbons, photos, banners, flowers. A couple girls, I couldn't tell who from this distance, were pinning a note and photograph to the bulletin board. We would have banned congregating in the commons in the mornings if we'd had to, Mrs. Tate said, as if she could tell what I was thinking. Just out of safety concerns. But it looks like nobody wants to hang out here anymore. Anyway, now we only use the commons for lunch shifts. We rocked straight through the commons. I tried to ignore my imagination, which had my feet sliding in sticky blood across the floor. I tried to focus on the sound of Mrs. Tate's shoes, clacking against the tile, trying to remind myself of all the things about breathing and focusing that Dr. Healer had spent so much time coaching me on. At the moment, I couldn't remember a single one. We passed through the doorway at the other end of the commons where the administration offices were. Technically, this was the front of the building. More offices were searching backpacks and passing metal detector wands over kids' clothes. All this security is going to make our mornings get off to a slow start, I'm afraid, Mrs. Tate sighed. But of course, this way we'll all feel safer. She whisked me past the officers and into the administration offices. The secretaries looked on with polite smiles, but didn't say a word. I kept my face tilted to the floor and followed Mrs. Tate into her office. I hoped she let me stay there a long time. Mrs. Tate's office was the opposite of Dr. Healer's, where Dr. Healer's was tidy and lined with rows and rows of reference books. Mrs. Tate's was a haphazard conglomeration of paperwork and educational tools, like it was part guidance office, part supply closet. There were books stacked on just about every flat surface, and photos of Mrs. Tate's kids and dogs everywhere. Most kids came to Mrs. Tate to either complain about a teacher or look through a college catalog, and that was pretty much it. If Mrs. Tate had gone to college hoping to counsel scads of troubled teenagers, she was probably pretty disappointed. If there can be such a thing as disappointment about not having enough troubled people in your life. She motioned for me to sit in a chair with a torn vinyl seat and she edged herself around a small file cabinet and sat in the chair behind her desk, dwarfed by stacks of papers and post-it notes in front of her. She leaned forward over the mess and folded her hands right in the middle of an old fast food wrapper. I was watching for you this morning, she said. I'm glad you came back to school shows guts. I'm giving it a try, I mumbled, rubbing my thigh absently. I can't make any promises I'll stay. Eighty-three and counting, I repeated in my head. Well, I hope you do. You're a good student, she said. Ah, she yelped, holding up one finger. She leaned to the side and pulled open a drawer of the file cabinet next to her desk. A framed photo of a black and white cat pawing at something wobbled as the drawer moved and I imagined her several times a day having to write the photo after it fell. She pulled a brown file folder out and opened it on the desk in front of her, leaving the file drawer hanging ajar. That reminds me. College. Yes, you were considering... She flipped through a few pages. Kansas State, if I remember correctly. She kept flipping, then ran her finger down a page and said, Yep, right here. Kansas State, and Northwest Missouri State. She closed the folder and smiled. I got the program requirements from each of them just last week. It's a little late to be just starting this process, but it shouldn't be a problem. Well, you'll probably have to account for some things on your permanent record, but really, you were never charged with, well, you know what I mean. I nodded. I knew what she meant. 
Not that it needed to be on my permanent record because I pretty much couldn't think of anyone in the country who hadn't heard of me by now. I was like best friends with the world, or maybe worst enemies. I changed my mind, I said. Oh, a different school? Shouldn't be a problem with your grades. No, I mean, I'm not going to college. Mrs. Tate leaned forward, resting her hand on the wrapper again. She was frowning at me. Not going. Right. I don't want to anymore. She spoke softly. Listen, Valerie. I know you blame yourself for what happened. I know you think you're just like him, but you're not. I sat up straighter and tried to smile confidently. This was not a conversation I wanted to get into today, of all days. Really, Mrs. Tate? You don't have to say this, I said. I touched my back pocket with the picture of Nick and me at Blue Lake in it for reassurance. I mean, I'm okay and everything. Mrs. Tate held up a hand and looked me straight in the eye. I spent more time with Nick than with my own son most days, she said. He was such a searcher, always so angry. He was one of those kids who was just going to struggle through life. He was so consumed with hate ruled by it, really. No, I wanted to shout at her. No, he wasn't. Nick was good. I saw it. I was struck with the memory of the night Nick had shown up at my house unexpectedly just as mom and dad began to rub up for their usual after-dinner bitch fest. I could feel it coming. Mom slamming plates into the dishwasher, mumbling under her breath, and dad pacing the floor between the living room and the kitchen, eyeing mom and shaking his head. The tension was building and I'd begun to get that tired feeling I'd had so often lately, wishing I could just go to bed and wake up in a different house, a different life. Frankie had already disappeared into his room, and I wondered if he got that tired feeling too. I was just climbing the stairs to my bedroom when the doorbell rang. I could see Nick through the window next to the door, shifting his weight from foot to foot. I'll get it, I hollered to my parents as I ran back down the stairs. But the argument had already started, and they didn't notice. Hey, I'd said, stepping out on the front porch. What's up? Hey, he said back. He'd held out a CD. I brought this, he said. I burned it for you this afternoon. It's all the songs that made me think about you. That's so sweet, I said, reading the back of the case, where he carefully typed all of the titles and artists of the songs. I love it. On the other side of the door, we could hear Dad's voice getting closer. You know, maybe I won't come home, Jenny. That's a great idea, he was growling. Nick looked at the door, and I could swear I saw embarrassment creep through his face. And something else. Pity, maybe? Fear? Maybe that same weariness I felt? Want to get out of here, he asked, shoving his hands in his pockets. It didn't sound too good in there. We can hang together for a while. I nodded, opening the door a crack and dropping the CD on the table in the foyer. Nick reached out and grabbed my hand, leading me to the field behind my house. We found a clearing and sprawled it on our backs in the grass, looking at the stars talking about anything, everything. You know why we get along so well, Val, he asked after a while. Because we think just alike. It's like we have the same brain. It's cool. I stretched, wrapping my leg around his. Totally, I said. Screw our parents. Screw their stupid fights. Screw everybody. Who gives a shit about them? Not me, he said. He scratched his shoulder. For a long time, I thought nobody would ever get me. But you really do. Of course I do. I turned my head and kissed his shoulder. And you get me too. It's kind of creepy the way they were, were so alike. Creepy in a good way. Yeah, in a good way. He turned to face me, propping himself up on an elbow. It's good that we have each other, he said. It's like, you know, even if the whole world hates you, you still have someone to rely on. Just the two of you against the whole world. Just us. At the time, my thoughts had been so consumed with mom and dad and their incessant arguing, I just assumed we were talking about them. Nick knew exactly what I was going through. He called his stepdad Charles his step de joie and talked about his mom's ever-changing love life as if it were some big joke. I'd had no idea he might have met us against everyone. Yeah, just us, 
I'd answered. Just us. I looked at the carpet of Mrs. Tate's office, once again struck with the feeling that I never knew Nick at all. That all of that soulmate stuff we talked about was just bullshit. That when it comes to reading people, I'm an F student. I felt a lump in my throat. How indulgent was that? The school outcast cries over the memory of her boyfriend? The murderer? Even I would hate me. I swallowed and forced the lump to go down. Mrs. Tate had sat back in her chair but was still talking. Valerie, you had a future. You were choosing colleges. You were getting good grades. Nick never had a future. Nick's future was this. A tear spilled over. I swallowed and swallowed, but it did no good. How did she know about Nick's future? You can't predict the future. God, if I could have predicted what happened, I would have stopped it. I would have made it go away, but I didn't. I couldn't. And I should have. That's what gets me. I should have. And now my future doesn't have college in it. My future is about being known around the world as the girl who hates everyone. That's what the newspapers called me, the girl who hates everyone. I wanted to tell Tate all of these things, but it was all so complicated and thinking about it made my leg throb and my heart ache. I stood up and shrugged into my backpack. I wiped my cheeks with the backs of my hands. I better get to class, I said. I don't want to be late on the first day. I'll think about it. College, I mean. But like I said, I can't make any promises, okay? Mrs. Tate sighed and stood up. She pushed the file drawer in but didn't move around the file cabinet. Valerie, she said, then stopped and seemed to reconsider. Try to have a good day, okay? I'm glad you're back, and I'll hang on to those program requirements for you. I started toward the door, but just before I reached for the doorknob, I turned. Mrs. Tate, have things changed much, I asked. I mean, are people different now? I didn't know why I hoped her answer would be, yes, everyone learned their lesson and now we're all one big happy family, just like they say we are in the newspapers. Or no, there were no bullies, it was all in your head just like they say. Nick was crazy and you bought it and that's all there was to it. You were angry for no reason. So angry, but it was all in your imagination. Mrs. Tate chewed on her bottom lip and seemed to really consider the question. People are people, she finally said, turning up her palms in a helpless, sad shrug. I think that was the last answer I wanted to hear.